Good morning, everybody, and uh, it's a pleasure to e meet all of you. I think we're ready to start the session, so we'll go ahead and start. Once again, let me welcome all of you this morning and uh, thank you for making time to join us for this uh, webinar on the state of enterprise architecture. Uh, I believe it's going to be a very intellectually stimulating session. I know many of you will leave here with a lot of uh, questions and we believe that we'll be able to answer them during this session. Uh, we plan to have this session for about an hour and a half and then we take some question and answer time for 10 minutes. So we believe that exactly or precisely by 12, we should be done. Um, let me state again in that um, the reason we're organizing this workshop is actually to bring some level of sensitization into many of you here gathered this morning to address critical things that are probably running through your minds. And uh, a lot of you gathered here will agree with me that most of us have actually been involved in designing and building systems around the various organizations that we're leading. However, as time goes on and the complexity increases, there's a need for you to relook really look at the entire architecture and state of how application landscape and infrastructure is designed in a very uh, structurally and logical manner so that in the event of issues, you would know how to address them. Uh, we've organized this workshop as one in a series of many that we'll be doing. And uh, along the line, we'll cover topics on integration as well. But essentially today, we're looking at enterprise architecture uh, prior to COVID and post COVID and uh, for most of you who are really pursuing a lot of transformations around digital transformation, you would recognize with me that uh, there's a lot of complexity increasing around your IT systems, and there's a need for you to have a very structurally designed enterprise architecture. On this note, I will introduce our team for this morning, and then we will actually welcome the guest speaker for today's session. So leading on this session is myself, Lana. Uh, along with me is Jose Texera, who is the Financial Services Director for Link, which is our international partner. And uh, the, our speaker for today's event is uh, Pedro Sosa, who is actually an enterprise architect, both in a consulting uh, perspective and also where he also is a professor in enterprise architecture for a university in Portugal. So he has uh, an experience of both worlds academic and also where he's actually dedicated his hands. So Pedro is going to be sharing a lot of experiences and a lot of uh, things that he's doing uh, with us, I mean, during this session. In addition to that, we would like to say that um, we're currently engaged in a project where we are designing a similar uh, project for an institution here in Ghana. And I believe that we stand to see how we can be of benefit to most of you on this roadmap. Thank you. Um, just a brief introduction of our company. So, we, I mean, that's just for you to know who we are. Uh, Kulana is a Ghanaian company, and uh, primarily our key focus is in driving and helping companies design their digital transformation uh, strategies. Uh, we're also very strong in dealing with data and analytics uh, projects. And, and last but not the least, uh, enterprise architecture and integration is uh, an area that uh, we do a lot of uh, projects in. I would invite my colleague Jose to introduce Link, and then we will move straight to the session. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, and uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, starting with with Link, Link is uh, an international technology company uh, specialized in in some specific areas like enterprise architecture, uh, middleware, and data analytic solutions. And we are uh, working uh, in several geographies uh, like Europe, uh, Africa, Middle East and South America um, for more than 20 years in this uh, type of, of projects. And um, going into the today's topic, uh, enterprise architecture. So we are seeing this is a, a strategic topic in today's agenda. Uh, because it's becoming a critical enabler for this post-COVID recovery and digital transformation. Um, as Gardner is saying, uh, by 2023, 60% of our organizations will depend on the enterprise architecture role 
to lead uh, this business approach to digital innovation. And we are seeing this all over the world. We are seeing that the uh, uh, leading uh, enterprises and organizations are moving away from the traditional role of enterprise architecture, more for uh, IT support role for uh, technical architecture and solution architecture, and are moving for a more strategic role where enterprise architecture is supporting uh, the digital uh, innovation and the digitalization of business and the critical capabilities for uh, innovative digital foundations, digital business design, and, and also the distributed decision enablement that is required for this transformation. And in this event, we'll see uh, how we can achieve this um, with uh, enterprise architecture. So on this note, I will pass uh, to my colleague Pedro uh, to uh, do the presentation. Uh, good morning to you all. I'm not video, sorry. Okay, good morning. I'm Pedro Souza. Um, so I'm very pleased to be uh, here with you in the in Accra, a nice town where I've just enjoyed the uh, jalop uh, rice, what was very good. So I'll start by uh, introducing the the concept of enterprise architecture. So we have. Can skip, yeah. Uh, so we have the same uh, basis, and uh, just to know that to tell you that enterprise architect is uh, is just a, a, a model of the organization where we can relate uh, uh, the processes or the products, the process, the, 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 the roles that people, the business that people have in, in, in the organization and how they uh, relate with uh, the applications, how the applications relate with the other applications, how the applications relate with services and uh, how these uh, uh, system artifacts then depend on the infrastructure, on the nodes, on the on the system software and the uh, network communications and so on. So it's mo it's no more than just a, a, a description of the key uh, artifacts of the organization and how they are uh, interlinked and how they are dependent among themselves. So this uh, why I want uh, such a model or such a, a vision of the organization, such a representation. Well, basically, you can uh, you need to do this. We are when you are planning ahead, so you need to know the the, the impact of the things that you are planning and the benefits into to mainly to to the business, and so. But you also need uh, to know how how, how it it uh, they uh, our organization today is working. So a way of saying the enterprise architecture is just a, a organization manual where you, you see how, uh, how it operates today and also uh, how uh, and also the, 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 the practices that we should have to change the organization. OK, when you are doing processes, when you are doing systems or when you are doing infrastructure, you have to know what you have now, what you expected to, to have in the in the, in the, in the future and uh, the procedures to to develop them. So that's in a, in a very short way to describe the enterprise architecture. Go ahead. Chang Chang. Muda Muda. Okay, uh, so in in uh, uh, with this uh, COVID uh, um, situation, uh, it's no it's no doubt that that the, the, this forces organizations to go uh, uh, to, to digital transformation much faster than they they expected for and then they were uh, ready for. And so uh, this uh, um, make it clear that the organization are more uh, uh, more ready for transformation will have to change it fast. And um, the, uh, as we can see here in the Gartner uh, uh, forecast, um, the, the areas that the organization need to change uh, to adapt is was mostly, of course, remote capability, but also uh, a bare IT and and uh, business alignment. So you you know the the, the dependencies between the the IT and and the, and the business, so you can transform faster, and uh, also greater agility in the in the in this uh, speed of change. So um, in this uh, the the. the the, the architecture 
uh, and the companies that have a better architecture uh, practices were uh, were um, more easily changed and adapt for this for this uh, COVID situation. Going. <laughs> Um, so as, as my colleague Jose said, uh, this uh, the, the the future is 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 making clear uh, that the, the the enterprise architecture is a key capability for organization to uh, evolve in, 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 and to change. The more fast you need to change, the more you depend on the enterprise architecture because it describes the organization as it is. How it as it is planned to be, and how how the things should be changing. So the more you have that uh, path documented, the more you have uh, uh, the, the, the more clear procedures on how to operate. The more easier is the change. Okay, and so uh, many organizations today uh, are are or before the COVID they are uh, operating well. They can they have the IT uh, structured uh, with the number of people to support their their business, and so they can handle a given pace of change uh, that they are used to. But as uh, digital transformation is coming faster and faster, they become overwhelmed with the with the, the the work they need to do to to keep up with the changes, and so they need to be more efficient in in handling the 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 changes in the organization, and that's the one of the key benefit of enterprise architecture to be more agile. That means more less effort to do the the the, the changes. Okay. So, how does enterprise architect impact digital uh, transformation? Um, so, basically, one uh, um, it, it it describes the uh, situation that you uh, uh, where you start from, and presents the situation where you want to to be, and uh, also presents the uh, describes the impacts of the, the changes that you are doing. And so you have all the information that you need to uh, actually do the, do the digital transformation with less surprises. OK, so you can do the the the, the right things because you, uh, everyone is aligned and, and, and everyone knows what you are doing. So you, you make sure the things that you do is benefiting the, the others and you also do the things right because it's also clear the way you should do it. As, as I said, the enterprise architect is not the description of the organization, is also the description of the, the way you should, the methods and the the, the, um, the rules and the principles that you should use when transforming the organization. Uh, so um, the key capabilities that you need to, to develop uh, when you are establishing, a, uh, when you are starting an enterprise architecture practice uh, or initiative in your organization, it starts by the uh, uh, ability to gather uh, different uh, persons from the different areas, so representative persons from the business, from the systems, from the infrastructure, and every way they can share knowledge and they can communicate and they can build the 2B scenarios. It's not possible to, to do this with, without a, a, a very streamlined way of communicating, a way of sharing knowledge. And, um, and this is, is what enterprise architecture is, is to make sure that different communities within the organization have a, a way to communicate and to share knowledge and to uh, state what they are uh, planning to do and make sure the, uh, everyone else also knows what each, what each one is doing. So it's basically a communication uh, a mechanism so that this this capability that you uh, the, the key capabilities that you should develop while you are developing enterprise architecture. So it's to um, uh, establish the, the the practices around keeping knowledge and keeping and sharing the knowledge of what the organization is and what is expected uh, to be in the different layers, business uh, processes and uh, um, systems and, and technology. And uh, so establish this communication channels and, and uh, groups of people from the different areas is the key capability that you should have 
when developing the enter enterprise architecture. Okay, go ahead. So, uh, how to achieve those 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 capabilities? Well, there are uh, many uh, um, uh, best practices that uh, and guidelines that you you can follow. Just select here a uh, uh, few and the main, basically the main. Uh, um, practice that we we or guidelines that we consider essential and um, so the first one is to adopt uh, uh, a driven uh, business driven outcome enterprise architecture approach which means that everything that we are doing in the in the in the IT should be related to to the business in in particular when you are initiating an enterprise architecture uh, pro project or initiative you there should be always a, a uh, benefit uh, very clear to to the business, so you can get funded and you, and 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 the, the the business will support you. So uh, don't don't start doing enterprise architecture without a clear uh, business uh, outcome. Even it's just a slide of or just a little bit of of the uh, of the scope of the enterprise architecture. The the, the other advice or guideline is is uh, is not to is to start with always with the future state with the vision uh, in the future state. So spend more time and more effort uh, dedicated to the design the vision where you want to be, and less uh, in creating the state of the current state of of systems and technology, because this part creating the 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 as is the, the the describing the organization as they are today is always very time consuming and never ends because the organization is always changing. So if you start, if you this was a, a, an error that many, many of us did in the in, in past decade, it was to have a, 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 a very nice, uh, complete description of the as is, which will never end it. And most of it will, will not be, will be changed uh, with the uh, forthcoming projects. So focus on the to be states and only uh, as, as, uh, only um, assess the current state uh, on a need to need to know basis. OK, and uh, um, finally, the just uh, the last comment is do not uh, you should follow, of course, standards and and uh, and uh, and uh, um, Frameworks, enterprise architecture frameworks. You do not need to, to invent your own, of course, but do not be too uh, obsessed to follow strictly the, the the standards and the frameworks because they they are too completed for you know, for your initial needs. Okay, so they are the same for initial organizations that start with a very low uh, maturity, and they are also the same for uh, very uh, mature organizations. And so, it's it's they are very complete and and. So so you don't need all that complexity at, at the very beginning. So just start developing. Of course, you should adopt, not 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 invent a framework, but don't uh, be stuck with the complexity of uh, uh, current uh, frameworks and uh, and enterprise architecture uh, standards. Okay, just go go around because it's a process. You should always evolve. Uh, please. Can you OK, so um, this enterprise architecture is, is very close related with uh, integration um, because integration, uh, we're talking about systems integration, of course, here, because integration is is uh, uh, an area where you need to know much about the other systems, about the other parties in the in the company. And so, uh, if you are uh, driving, a, uh, so the, if you are driving an enterprise architecture, you may as well join and and come up with a, a, a serious uh, integration competence center or develop the the, the integration uh, capabilities in your organization. Because most of the effort that you will be doing for enterprise architecture, it's it's just what you also need to do for. Uh, developing the integration capability within your organization okay, because the integration requires to know the impacts do what everyone is doing the service that you can uh, need to know the, to, to integrate and, and so on and we also need to support uh, practices rules uh, and the communication channels between the different parties that you are integrating so 
Um, if you are starting an enterprise architecture, uh, you may as well start along with with uh, an, uh, a serious uh, uh, integration uh, uh, capability in your organization. And if you are starting uh, an integration capability in your organization, so you may as well also develop the enterprise architecture. You may start the enterprise architecture just for supporting and normalizing and rationalizing and giving principles and define how to, to do it for this integration capability and then expand to other areas. But uh, uh, most of it, there's a major interception between the, cap the capability of integration, so uh, developing those capabilities in the orga organization and the initiative of enterprise architecture. OK, so it's always a good to, to join them and develop all, uh, side by side. OK, so now we're going for the, the demo uh, of our uh, product. So Link has developed this uh, Atlas uh, solution. Um, it's an enterprise architecture solution that we developed because it, um, it makes uh, uh, it has a different paradigm when when the most common ones, uh, the other tools, because we have uh, uh, um, follow a set of principles that I will uh, uh, say now. One is that all uh, uh, um, representations of the organization are indeed uh, uh, um, like a movie, not as a picture, because we have this time bar that allows us to see the contents of that uh, uh, that uh, representation of that map as it was, as it is today, and how it is expected to be given the uh, changes of the project pipeline. Um, the other thing that is that uh, since all uh, manual, uh, all um, blueprints, all the uh, diagrams, architectural diagrams that are made uh, by hand with the design uh, manually, they tend to be obsolete and they tend to uh, take a lot of effort to update them or to keep them updated um, as company evolves. And so we have uh, uh, developed this tool where all blueprints, all maps are generated automatically based on information, of course, that we uh, tend to capture. So in this demo, we'll uh, show uh, only, we'll pick a few uh, representation, a few aspects of Atlas that we think that is more relevant. And there will be much more that we'll not show that we can then demonstrate to you. OK, so Jose, can you start the video? Hello, I'm David Marira, and I'm a consultant at Link. I'm here today to present Atlas, an enterprise architecture tool by Link. This is Atlas' starting page for a given repository and a given user profile. The initial page is a set of entry points that go directly to the most used pages of each profile on a selected repository. There's also a set of menu options that allow the user to perform the necessary activities for developing and managing the organization's enterprise architecture. In Atlas, architectural representation is like a movie, supporting time, travel, and Analysis, visualizing past, current, and to-be architectures. In Atlas, blueprints are generated automatically from the information kept in Atlas repository. Blueprints display a specific architectural view. Here is a blueprint representing an application landscape of an organization. Each blue box represents an application, and they're layered out according to some functional arrangement. We will use this blueprint to represent the time analysis Atlas supports in all blueprints. The time bar on top allows us to see how the application landscape evolves. Each mark represents the moment where the application landscape changes, either in the past or in the future, according to planned or ongoing projects. A change is an application that becomes productive and appears in the blueprint, or an application that's decommissioned, thus it disappears from the blueprint. One can see the applications in production at the current date and in the past by dragging this bar to the left or into the future by dragging this bar to the right. 
We can also use this time bar to analyze the application landscape gap between two dates. By widening the time bar between two dates, one can compare how the application landscape changes between those dates. New applications are marked with a green stripe, and decommissioned applications are marked with a red stripe. For example, to see what is expected to happen in future years, we move the left-hand side handle of the time bar to the current date and move the right-hand side handle to the desired future date. Or we can see what happened in the last months by moving the period backwards. Gap and change analysis. Atlas also allows us to search for other categories of change between two dates, such as applications with new components, new releases, or support new business processes. Users can configure their categories of changes. Changes can be of different types, and users can configure their categories of changes. To do such analysis, one selects depth and desired category. Changed applications are marked in yellow. By default, all change categories are selected, but I can filter and select one of the predefined categories. Of course, users can define new change categories. Choosing all change category and looking to the CRM application get details like this. We can see that the CRM application will gain a new module between these dates. It will jump from release 6.0 to 8.0, and it will support new capability. Visualizing artifact life cycles. Another time analysis, Atlas allows the visualization of life cycles. One can define any number of life cycles for each artifact. The default life cycle is of the live life cycle, where artifacts are being conceived, implemented, become productive, and then are decommissioned. So. If I select the life cycle option, I can see all the applications in their life cycle state at the selected date. So now I can see all the applications and I can see the state they're in on any date. So for example, this one is in its conceiving state. This one is in another implementation state. These three applications are in the decommission state. And these three applications in purple are in deprecated state. All other applications are in a productive state. Users can change these life cycles and add new ones. For example, selecting the GDPR life cycle, we can see the state of GDPR compliance of each application and how it evolves over time. So for example, these applications in green are now compliant with the GDPR. In red, they are not compliant. And for example, in purple, they're under adaptation. Examples of dependencies and impact analysis. Application dependencies via services. After presenting the time analysis capabilities that Atlas supports on any blueprint, we now present other blueprints. Blueprints are designed to answer specific questions. For example, to see our applications interact with services, one has the application integration blueprint. So if I navigate the application integration blueprint, one can see on the left-hand side the services that are consumed by this application and the applications that provide those services. On the right, the services that selected application provides. And it's being used by other applications in the architecture. Applications supported business and required infrastructure. To see how application supports the business, one has the application layer blueprint. So if I now get to the layer, I can see how this application supports the business, but also what infrastructure supports this application on the bottom. So these layers follow the Archimates model. So on the top are presented the elements of the business layer and followed by the elements of the application layer, the services, and the application and the database. On the bottom, the elements of technology layer. One can adjust the complexity of the blueprint and display only the relevant information to a given user profile. For example, this blueprint can be simplified into only the business process 
the selected application, and the system software. So if I navigate the application layer simply and show the connections, I see the same connections that I've seen in the previous map. But now I'm only focusing on the business processes, on my application, and the system software. Following the logic of this blueprint, one can navigate the system software layered blueprint and see the impact that Postgres SQL has on the IT landscape. So if this software system fails, these databases will be impacted. They will impact those applications, the services, all these processes, these business services, these capabilities, and ultimately this goal. Exploring Direct Dependencies Blueprints show the dependencies that are relevant for a given profile or for the understanding of a given issue, hiding details not relevant for its purpose. However, there's another visualization that shows all the raw dependencies between architectural elements. By selecting Explore the Object, one can see all the dependencies of Postgres SQL with other architecture artifacts. One can click on other elements to add all their dependencies into this view. The colors represent the class of the architectural element. Here one can see the class of each element. So for example, this red circle, it's an application, and this green circle that I pressed is the database schema. And of course, in this view, I can also see or distinguish the objects that are in production, not only on the current day, but also in the past and the future. And they are shadowed when they are not in production. Using matrix to visualize and edit dependencies. We now present matrices as another type of architectural view. They show predefined dependencies between the entities in the rows and the columns, directly or indirectly. As happens with other visualizations, matrices also support navigation in time, allowing us to see how dependencies state on a given date. Light shadowed are inactive dependencies and heavy shadows are active dependencies. We can also use matrix to edit the connections between the rows and columns. When I enter edit mode and press on a cell, I'm setting a connection between the row. In this case, document management with this column product design. If I press again, I'm unsetting this connection. Visualizing the impact of a vendor. Providers may fail to fulfill their services, and so it is important to see the impact of a vendor failure to fulfill expected services. The vendor impact blueprint shows the artifacts that are dependent on the selected vendor, as well as the organization capabilities and goals that are dependent on such artifacts. In this case, the vendor supports this application and these nodes and indirectly influences all the elements of the architecture on the right. And then those elements influence these capabilities. So by measuring the dependencies or the risk related to these capabilities, we can measure the vendor risk to the architecture. Capability map and realization. Capabilities are often a way to express the areas to improve an organization. To see what capabilities are planned to be developed in the next year, one simply opens the capability organic map. In green are fully active capabilities. Those that do not exist yet or are still in implementation are in red or yellow respectively. To see what artifacts are needed to achieve this capability fully, one can open the capability realization blueprint of the desired capability. So in this case, these are the artifacts that are needed to achieve this capability fully. To see how the capability has been realized over time, one goes back to the time bar. At the beginning, only the service bus was supporting this capability. As we go through time, we can see that now there's a process and a unit that is also supporting this capability, and it improves the capability realization metric. Then there's a new project, and this project creates this application that will, in the end, fully support this capability. By selecting this lifecycle flag, we can see that now the capability is green, meaning they are fully active. 
Atlas provides several alternatives to keep architectural information up to date. We have seen a few of the many blueprints Atlas provides out of the box. As already mentioned, users can easily add new blueprints or adapt existing ones. Now we will show examples of integrations of Atlas with external systems used in an application development integration with a project management tool. Now I will simulate an integration with a project management tool by importing a file containing the list of ongoing projects. This file is imported on a daily or weekly basis. And in today's importation, one project delays its completion date and a new project appears. The imported file contains the name of the project, their begin and end dates, and the project manager. Regarding the last importation, the document management project has a new end date and the mobile app project appears as a new project since it wasn't uploaded in Atlas until this moment. Atlas processes the imported file and marks the delayed application with a purple mark. This means that this application is in a delayed go life state. So the managers of the projects that are dependent on this artifact will be notified by email. To show that I'm opening the mailbox, I, Project Manager of Invoices Approval WF, receive an email saying that there's a project that conflicts with mine, and I can see more details by following this link. My link directs me to the Gantt view, where I can see my project in the middle. On the right, other projects that depend on the artifacts that my project will create or change. On the left, the projects that create or change artifacts that my project depends on. In this case, Atlas is reporting that there might be dependency issues on my project due to the project that was delayed and now overlaps with my project. That was inferred by analyzing the artifacts that project interacts with. By default, the dependency between projects is computed based on the artifacts that each project creates, uses, changes, or decommissions. But users define other criteria for project dependency as, for example, based on common goals or capabilities. Visualizing impact analysis between projects. By clicking on the selected project, one can see the details of the impact analysis performed on the project impact blueprint. Here, we can see on the right the other projects that interact with the artifacts that my project is creating and changing. And on the left are the projects that create or change artifacts that my project interacts with. Since the document management project is a conflicting project, we look for its connections and see the artifact causing the conflict between the two projects. Atlas can do impact analysis between projects whenever it knows the artifacts involved in each project. However, that is not the case for the new project that appears in the list of ongoing projects that was imported from the project management tool. In this case, Atlas sends an email to the project managers of the new project asking for more information. Handling a new project and integration with DevOps tools. Here is the email sent to the project manager of the new project with a link to a form to be filled with the project, such as small description of the project, domain, and sponsor. In this case, I'll just say who will be the architect of this project. All these fields are configurable, and you can add or remove entries from this form. I'll just save this and skip to the second part of the form, which is the state in which artifacts the project will create, change, use, or decommission. Here, we only have applications, services, and system software, but this can easily be changed. For this example, I'll just say that this project will create a new application called the home banking mobile app. To map this application in the landscape application, I'll just say that this application belongs to the finance domain. I'll save the form and I'm directed to the project impact blueprint with the information that the project will create a new application. If I go back to the application's landscape blueprint and I refresh this view, I can see the new application marked in gray because it is still in the conception state. If I navigate the application structure of this new application, as you can imagine, it's empty because the project manager didn't state anything else about this application. 
to automate the loading of this application structure into Atlas, we developed a plugin for Maven that runs in developed environments. This way, Atlas is updated with factual and timely information about application development. So I already have here a new project, and I'm going to compile it for the first time. I'm doing this project manually, but of course, we can integrate this into a CI CD pipeline and automate this process. Now that it's finished, if I return to the application structure blueprint and regenerate this view, I can see the components being developed, such as three new components, a new service, and access to an already existing database and system software. All of this information is gathered through the plugin without any additional effort to the developer because the plugin will fetch all of this information from the POM configuration file and through the source code, looking at the notation text. Here, I can also interact and change the classification of these components. If I enter edit mode, I can drag these components and classify them as a presentation for this one and integration for this one. In addition to this information, the plugin also inserts information about the releases and environments being used. If I navigate to the application context, I can see that the plugin also created a new release for this application, version 1.0. And if I go into another view, I can see that the system software releases are being used as well as nodes being used. Further down the line, if I install this into a quality environment, and I go back to the map and refresh it, as you can imagine, this release is also installed into a quality environment. And in the end, when I install this in a production environment by running this command, I'm going back once again to this map and refresh. Not only this release is installed in a new environment in the production environment, but also loses his green mark which means that this application or this release is now in production and is no longer under implementation. Going back to the application blueprint, one can see the application no longer has the gray nor the green mark. Automating processes supporting enterprise architecture day-to-day -day activities. Many enterprise architecture activities are better structured in workflows or processes. This allows better control and quality of the enterprise architecture. In Atlas, automated workflows can be defined in BPMN. For example, the process presented describes the activities required for retiring an application service. All these tasks will be assigned to the users belonging to this group, ICC. The first user that starts the activity will automatically assign the activity to him and all the other users will no longer see the activity in their pool. Each user has their work list. Here I can see assigned tasks assigned to me or see those assigned to my pool by pressing here. The task on the pool is tasks assigned to the groups where I belong to. From here, I can open the task itself like this and follow the step-by-step -step description on how to realize this task. Once I have opened the task, it will be assigned to my pool or to my cases. I can return this task back to the pool. I can also return the task to another user or group, or I can leave notes for other users to see during the process. When the user completes a task, Atlas checks for any subsequent gateway in the process model, and the work list will ask the user to select the path to follow as they exist in the process definition. We have seen various blueprints, forms, entities, and relationships out of the box. However, in Atlas, it is possible to define other customizations and align with the requirements of the end users. Atlas can virtually integrate with any external tool if it has support for REST services or similar such as project management tools, DevOps environments, and cloud providers. We use those integrations to reduce the effort of keeping the architecture up to date 
and notification of relevant changes are the case. With information, I appreciate your attention. Thank you. I'm David. Hello again. Um, so now we as uh, we will present some case studies that uh, from world class organizations. So uh, the first uh, the first case is about uh, an organization, an oil uh, uh, company um, that uh, has a had a, a strong IT transformation program. Do mostly of uh, because of obsolescence of their key uh, systems, and so they have to uh, develop and 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 set up a, a large part. Of a large number of key systems because the old ones are not, are not, were not uh, in conditions to operate no, no longer. In, the, in this process, they uh, decided to go for the cloud infrastructure. And so they have tens of teams uh, and each, each in, and, and, and they, they end up with, with uh, hundreds, uh, over 500 uh, new environments in the cloud. You, in, in the cloud, but with different vendors. So when they figure out uh, they were no longer controlling the, the, the and they are no longer aware of of what's what's happening in the in, with the, with their systems in the cloud. They were lost because they have too many hundreds of uh, of environments in the, in the cloud, and they need to to manage them. And basically, they need to. They were having problems between the transfer between the of the transfer between the, the different cloud vendors and they have no map of or have no, no blueprint of uh, how their systems were being deployed in the cloud. And so they, they decide to to uh, use the enterprise architecture tool to represent how they were deploying the systems in in, in the cloud. So they, they integrate uh, the tool with the cloud manager of the different uh, vendors and to gather information from from their their um, the, what they have deployed in the cloud and also in the in the in the local on premises or in their local systems or the local infrastructure and they build up this huge uh, blueprint with uh, where they can drill down from the the, the, the systems up to up to the, the cloud inf infrastructure and they manage to uh, uh, Sort out their their initial problems of manage all the systems, and also the, the data uh, transfer between the, the different cloud vendors they are, they were having. So now they are starting to use this information to support the rest of the transformation in their organizations. In the other case, it's there. The other case is about a European agency. Uh, it's, a, it's a public uh, institution and uh, it's uh, a very reduced IT staff that uh, um, develop the, their projects through uh, third party vendors. However, since they are a public organization, they must have uh, tenders for all or pretty much everything they want to do. And um, and they must specify in full detail the things that uh, they need to be done in their tenders. But this is a hard task to do if um, uh, if you uh, use develop all the systems uh, based on 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 third party tenders because the knowledge to do the the, the tenders uh, cannot be left to to, to the vendors. The, the agency must have. Uh, it, it, uh, it have that, that knowledge, and so they use this uh, uh, integration um, with the, the CI/CD pipeline that they standardize. So it's, it's something that they force the vendors to comply with. So all vendors must adopt that uh, CI/CD pipeline technology, and they integrate the the, 
de enterprise architecture tool with that uh, CD pipeline that feeds uh, the, the the system structure and the system uh, components as they are as the vendor is is deploying them or or developing them uh, into the the enterprise architecture tool. And thus, uh, what they have is they have uh, not only all uh, uh, the information they need about uh, each system, so they can uh, produce their tenders to develop new systems, as well as they are able to monitor almost in real time what the tender is doing, what the vendor is doing, because uh, uh, the vendor must fulfill with a, a given a specified uh, rules and principles, and and and, and they must be uh, compliant with a number of, of things that the, the this agency imposes to the vendors. And by this this way, when when the vendor is developing things, when the vendor is even uh, long before they deliver the the, the systems, uh, the agency already know what they are doing, when they are doing. And so it controls the the, the 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 compliance criteria in a, in a, in a, in, a, in pretty much in real time, and uh, this allows them to to keep the staff of the IT uh, low, um, given the number of projects they have. Okay, and and and, and it's a very uh, large uh, knowledge base they are building, only by standardizing the the the, the environment that uh, vendors uh, use to develop their systems. So the third case uh, is about an, an, a governmental health ministry um, that uh, before COVID, he, he, they start this enterprise architecture uh, approach to develop their um, ecosystem of the health systems in that country. So uh, the country has over 100 organizations uh, that are related to health, to public health, like hospitals and the and, 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 uh, medical uh, research institute and so on. And so all these public uh, organizations, they, they were mapped and traced the service they, they provide and the, the service they, they consume. This was before COVID, so when they started the, the, the change and developing applications to the COVID area, they were they were pretty much prepared. So and they are able to develop much faster than before, uh, not because they work more, but because they were more prepared. And uh, they also uh, be able to manage the churn, aggregates of churn of key people that left the, the institution in the process. But they uh, were uh, uh, able to capture their, their much of their needed uh, knowledge about the systems. So uh, because they were uh, having that knowledge base based on the enterprise architecture. So they did pretty well in this uh, uh, change and uh, the need they were able to respond with the needs uh, applications and with the lack of people that uh, meanwhile has left the, the organization. The fourth case is about uh, uh, a finance institution, European one, um, that has gone through a, a major uh, and, and, and very strong uh, transformation initiative. Um, their business, they have to, in their business, they have to integrate with uh, many uh, systems from their partners. And so uh, when they uh, start to implementing this transformation or digital transformation initiative, their rate of changes that they had to the rate of new applications, the rate of new integrations and the rate of, of uh, their IT uh, complexity has increased a lot. So they become they, 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 the, the, the landscape of their uh, IT has become has grown a lot with this digital transformation. But despite of this uh, increase in complexity, they have been able to uh, uh, respond uh, uh, properly without increasing their, their, their staff. 
and so they they were able to do the troubleshooting whenever there's a problem in the in the uh, as normal because they have all the uh, all the information they need to have on with uh, just a click so um, and they uh, also be able to uh, do much more planning um, because they they planning of the uh, incoming projects or forthcoming projects because they know the details of the project that are ongoing so they can plan much 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 in much detail in in and, and much more ahead in time than than before so they are able to 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 deal with this increased uh, rate of new applications with this uh, uh, new rate of services integrations without being overwhelmed by the amount of work that they would need to do if they were not following the enterprise architecture tool uh, initiative. So uh, this in, in enterprise architecture initiative basically uh, it's a saver for for IT staff because they are able to produce more with less effort. So um, how Kulan and Link can help you? So the, 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 our approach so we, we, uh, that we advise is to first uh, assess uh, uh, your current enterprise arch uh, architecture capabilities and level of, of maturity, and, you, and, you, and we, we, we can help you on that. We can also help you in defining the, the, the model of enterprise architecture for your organization based on, on, on best process and framework. Like like TOGAF or Archimate, and, and and also include the governance of the enterprise architecture, the governance of those practices, and the process and tool that tools that you should have to streamlining the enterprise architecture in your organization, and thus supports a uh, higher uh, uh, rate of change. Because it's all all up to that. If you uh, don't have architecture, if you don't have a streamlined enterprise architecture, then you will be faced with a very, will be overwhelmed with the amount of work that you need to do to support the change of rate that is business will require. Um, we also help you uh, can help you in step up, coach and empowerment of the, your, your team, and now it adopts. Uh, how it can adopt the, the, the enterprise architecture model uh, that you want to, to achieve. And of course, we can also uh, uh, help you in accelerating the, the transformation for the new states of new uh, uh, landscape that you want to, be, to, to achieve. Can it be a cloud na native architecture? Can be APIs? Uh, can be microservers, event space architecture? We can help on design, help you designing the, those uh, architectures, and also to uh, uh, actually operate the the, the the enterprise architecture initiative, and also uh, to support you if you want in the ICC. So set up an integration competence center in your organization. So just to conclude, uh, the key takeaways that I uh, that came up of this uh, session. So if you want agility in your organization, uh, and of course management will want uh, agility uh, that you need to to address the, the the changes, then you must be agile for sure. The more agile you are, the more easy changes are becoming. And the enterprise architecture plays a crucial role. It's a, is, is a determining factor for those for reducing the efforts of change. OK, of course you can change without enterprise architecture, but you will be overwhelming by the amount of work that it takes and it takes time and take and, and risk is higher. Okay? And so we can see that the more uh, 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 organizations are have uh, mature enterprise architecture practice, the easiest they adapt. So the more a enterprise architecture, the more uh, faster they can adapt. So uh, we are here to help you uh, into engaging this uh, journey in digital transformation. And thank you very much for for uh, being here uh, with us and uh, looking forward to meet you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pedro. Um, 
very much appreciated. I think we are now at the point where we will uh, take some questions and answer time. But Pedro, before I give the audience the opportunity to do this, I just have a few questions that I want to throw at you to see if you can probably address that for the sake of our audience. So in this webinar, we have CIOs and various uh, stakeholders and organizations that have joined us to enjoy this session with you. Now, so I'm a CIO, I've inherited an environment that I was probably not involved in designing and building it. How do I lead a conversation internally on enterprise architecture in my organization? That's number one. And number two, what sort of skill sets do I require to really engage on this initiative? I think that this is some of the things we see coming up as we try to address this uh, kind of topics in the market. So if you can do that, and after that, the floor is open to everyone. Uh, please just raise your hand and then you will either type your question or just go ahead and ask and address it. But thank you, Pedro. OK, so uh, uh, to 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 start this uh, uh, enterprise architect initiative, uh, you should uh, gather the, the you should have this this uh, business drive uh, outcome and therefore you should you should uh, um, um, set up with a, a group of people that involves business uh, in application and, and, and te technology together and they will uh, they will uh, uh, define the scope of this enterprise architect initiative as to, to start with so uh, that's that's so for find a, find a, a, a out the initial problem that uh, I, the business has and uh, set up those those people those that group to start uh, designing a, a solution for that problem okay so you must have a pain so and then you some pain that you want to solve with the price architecture and in that process you must uh, or you should uh, group together the business the, someone from the systems and someone from the IT to uh, come up with uh, an evolution of that of that or that uh, solution for that pain that 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 you, that you have and in the process you start developing and structure the enterprise architect don't try to try to set up an enterprise architect initiative without having a, a problem to solve okay okay the second question Pedro was about skills. Uh, what sort of skill sets internally will I need to really govern my EA and all the various things you've discussed this morning? OK, so the skills. Well, uh, enterprise architecture, very broad, uh, uh, very wide uh, uh, domain, but basically you need the skills to uh, put all these people, so business system and infrastructure, to talk and, in each, and understand each other. So basically you need a way to specify requirements in a very precise and uh, rigorous manner. You, uh, and that probably includes uh, developing um, BPMN models, process models, developing uh, uh, requirements models. Uh, so you, at the level of requirements, you need some 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 uh, skills, and that is essential to articulate business and IT. At the level of systems, you need some uh, generic uh, skills on enterprise architect on on system architect, and uh, so so. Uh, but you need to put them in a way that uh, everyone can understand your design. So you probably need skills on some uh, enterprise architecture framework or language like uh, Archimate or other. And uh, at infrastructure, you need these skills to design systems and to and to present them to, 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 the, to the other guys. So it starts by basic skills on the different areas. I think there's a hand raised and uh, let's give the Emmanuel Ofori button. Please go ahead. And then there's also a question that I will read out once uh, Emmanuel is done. So go ahead, Emmanuel. OK, yeah, good morning. Good morning. Go ahead. OK, so I have about some three questions. Um, you know, uh, typically EA or enterprise architecture have been seen as an abstract, uh, abstract Concept. And typically, 
when we are doing uh, training, we do other toga for Zagma or FEM. I want to find out the Atlas product you uh, uh, presented. Is it based on any of this, or it is a, a, a framework uh, uh, agnostic? Is that in, I mean, it's on its own? Okay, so let me answer the. If I may answer the first question, and then you do the the other two. So. In Atlas, you can define your own model. You can support any of those uh, frameworks that you said, Zachman, DAF, or the TOGAF. So it's up to you to decide which 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 one you want to you you want to address. And but in Atlas, the architecture is not uh, abstract thing. It's a very concrete thing. It's so con concrete that you are able to 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 capture information from from different applications and from the, the developing environments. So it's not a theory. It's just it's really uh, something that you apply to your your day to day life. Okay, but but you can use those frameworks to uh, uh, map and to structure your day to day activities. Okay. okay. OK, now I the, think second the second part was to find out whether Atlas is uh, generic for designing EA or it was tailored towards a specific framework. You want to take that to zero, Pedro? No, it's 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 generic, uh, so we, we, we can configure any framework that that you want. You can configure the, 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 the different concepts. And you can configure uh, uh, you can configure the the process or the the the, the, the procedure that or the practice that you want that you need to make that thing happen by using the the process. So you, okay, you, second question okay. and third. Okay, my second question is that uh, you know you spoke about um, Atlas or oh, sorry a, a link. Uh, be able to help us to do an assessment of an e, e state, you know, it, then we can make a, a case. But where, whereby, what if you have a situation where you have to present a case to my man for approval before any uh, vendor can be brought in? Mm -hmm. In that case, can Atlas, I keep saying Atlas, can a link or Kulana help us, you know, do that to present a business case mm -hmm. or why we need an EA to my man? before, I mean, you come in. Yes, uh, let me answer that. Um, in that regard, yes, we do what we call a technology discovery session. So um, it would be typically, depending on the landscape of your environment, a period of maybe eight to 12 weeks. And I say that duration is because in, in one context, we had a over 100 and something applications, and you want to find out and interrogate to understand what the integrate, I mean, the various uh, interdependencies between applications are before you come up with what we call the as it, as it is uh, mapping. And then from there, like Pedro discussed earlier on that, there is always the need to define the to be. So once we have that, we can uh, give you that assessment report. We can then make a business case to your respective uh, uh, executives before you get into the real EA design project at that stage. I don't know if I've answered you. Okay, yes. 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 We have a client, we've worked, with, we've worked with a client specifically here in that kind of journey. Yeah. Um, your third question, because I have more questions, I have to read well, one you, from. No, I, uh, I, I, I think it's it, it answered in the earlier one. So okay. Just, so, okay. Thanks. Perfect. Perfect. Let me read the question from uh, Agbenya Adote. And uh, is TOGAF something one must consider to understand enterprise architecture? Uh, Pedro, Jose, one of you wants to take it. And then after that, I'll come to you, Raymond. Just hold it for well, a minute, Rip. TOGAF uh, is, uh, clarifies a set of concepts that is useful for communication, basically, because in IT it's very uh, uh, hard to to it's all better, better state. It's very easy to use the same word with different meanings. Okay, for uh, uh, when you say an application. Well, for the infrastructure guy, an application is a set of uh, uh, servers with running on a different set of nodes, and it's many things. But for the business guy, it just sees one thing. So, 
Tograph is very useful because it 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 separates what uh, it, it clarifies a, a, a given number of concepts that are very useful. For instance, distinguish what is system software, what is technology, then what is an application that you develop. So those things the the, the that need to be uh, clarified are basic concepts. What's a service? What's a process? So um, we all talk about those things, but uh, it's very easy to to be misleading about those concepts. So Togaf is a, 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 a good starting point to clarify those things. Of course, then they define a lot of other things like the common uh, uh, meta model and uh, and uh, and a lot of uh, other uh, procedures that you might might or may not follow, or you might complete or partially. So, uh, as, as I said, TOGAF is very complex and it should not be followed from A to Z when you are starting, okay? Because that will be stuck from the very beginning. It's too well overwhelming. But the, the, the meta model concepts are, are very useful for those that are starting. Okay. okay? Um, but on a concept a level, it's plain to... from the same person on security. I don't know if you want to take it before I ask Raymond to ask this question. And the follow up question is, uh, let me just read it quickly. It says, can security processes be integrated into Atlas? I guess from uh, from uh, from the question, it's more from Atlas. Um, the answer is yes. But Pedro, do you want to elaborate on that? Because I know we have a yeah. project we are dealing on something similar. Yeah, so that we can. So yeah so if if security uh, really uh, requires you to know in very detailed manner your current architecture for sure and if you have a, a, a and, and then the place where that description is uh, natural place for that description to be is exactly or to exist it's exactly in an enterprise architecture tool so atlas is able to describe with all the the details that you want uh, that you feel necessary, uh, the basically the infrastructure and and and, and the applications and all the real security related aspects, and in that manner you can have a, a good and good knowledge base of your uh, organization in the in the perspective of, of of the security, and then you in Atlas you can also uh, configure uh, and define any process that you want. As, uh, and so you can yes you can uh, define the procedures that you want to 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 to, to adopt in your organization to handle security okay in our okay let's take a question from raymond raymond please go ahead the floor is yours thank you very much jonathan and thank you very much uh, pedro right uh, i think pedro gave a very simplified you know definition of ea as an organization's you know manual showing how it operates today and uh, probably the path to the future my organization is 60 years old this year and um, in fact this is the first time i'm hearing about ea within the organization i would say that uh, virtually every decade every decade we use um, strategic business goals business strategies to drive um, the organization now, my, my point is, how different is business strategy from um, architecture? Uh, assuming I take away data and the functions within the organization. If they are not the same, how are the two aligned or where do they converge? That's the first issue. The second one is, um, if I'm using architecture or if I want to develop or adopt one, what are some of the pitfalls that I, you know I have to look out for? Thank you. Okay, I'll start. Pedro, you can from answer some question. of them. I can answer the second one. Whichever you want to go, go for okay. it. Okay. No, I'll first. I'll, I'll answer the first one. So, of course, the uh, st strategic uh, uh, view of the businesses, the 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 the, 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 the strategic planning. Uh, of the, the business evolution in the organization 
is is uh, uh, one of the key topics in enterprise architecture. That's where that's where you should start. Um, it 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 because it then everything goes uh, through the so uh, will, everything will follow from that strategic plan. You can derive the to be states. In, in in processes in 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 so in the business, in the systems in in the infrastructure. So that's the best way to to start and 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 then the best way to define that uh, strategy in business is just to define the capabilities that you want to achieve with a given transformation. So if you define the capabilities of the organization. Uh, if you do an assessment what uh, organization can do today, that's the capabilities of today, and you want to say, OK, for tomorrow or for next year, I need to be doing those new things. I, have, I, I need to acquire uh, to have these new capabilities that gap in capabilities is the is is the, what drives your transformation and then you decide what new systems what new requirements you need or new requirements and new systems you need to to adapt or to, to develop and that also then follows by the new uh, technology that you need to 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 to, to establish so starting by the uh, business uh, strategy uh, is the best way to start because it's it, uh, uh, make sure that everyone else is on the same page. OK, they are, have the same targets. We need to achieve those those new business goals. And yes, it says the first chapter of, of enterprise architecture. If you start with the frameworks, the, f the first step is just for instance, TOGAF, uh, ADM is the first step is really making that uh, vision of the of the business for the next uh, years. Jonathan, please follow with the second answer, please. Uh, I think you want to repeat your second one, uh, Raymond. Yes, uh, the second issue is borders on uh, pitfalls. If you are adopting um, EA, what are some of the pitfalls that one has to look at? Well, first of all, let me answer it this way, that if you haven't adopted an EA approach to building your current ecosystem or as you're progressing, what will be the significant challenges you're looking at or you're going to be facing? So just like you rightly said, your organization is about 60 years old. Uh, I'm sure when you do a map, a mapping of that 60 years old, different IT systems have come in and either been decommissioned or in, in, improved into the environment. And uh, for most people who have probably joined and become CIOs in your organization, I'm sure one of the things they would like to look out for is what is really the architecture landscape of both infrastructure and applications within the environment. So if you didn't have that kind of context, I think one of the things I will say is that a significant pitfall is that you're really operating in the dark where you just have an idea or you have a uh, 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 a paper-based uh, mapping of what is in the environment. So what EA seeks to achieve, especially in this era where, I mean, sometimes there is this uh, paradigm of thinking where people say technology drives business, or I mean, technology drives IT. I mean, the, uh, IT drives business and or the technology that drives IT. Depending on whatever you look at it, the bottom line is that the IT, uh, IT environment is getting more complex and there are more uh, systems you are deploying either from external uh, solutions providers or internal. And like uh, Pedro gave the example of the cloud. So having a very well designed enterprise architecture in your environment helps you see the complexity that exists from the perspective of visibility. The other thing is that even when you take a situation where you've also built, let's say, incident management systems that track how uh, problems are uh, reported and resolved. From the EA perspective, as uh, uh, David was showing in the graphical uh, mapping that he did, you can actually dr drill down into the specific applications to see what the dependencies and what the technology landscape is. So you have that level of insight and detail. And maybe to put it in a, uh, in a very uh, general context, it's more like having the architectural design of the house you live in 
if any day you decide to do some improvements on that house, you know which uh, uh, aspects of the house to to break and rebuild. And then there are aspects of the house that you don't touch because they found they are basically the, the the foundational basis of how you designed it. So that level of visibility and insight, it's something you cannot compromise as your landscape becomes complex. And I believe that um, this will probably answer uh, the other doubts that you, you presented. Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan? Yes, go ahead. Pedro. OK, Pedro. just Pedro. just to add a, a brief comment about uh, this this question, because I think it's it's really uh, important question. Uh, from what we see from other customers, one of the major pitfalls is um, assuming that the vendor is responsible for the solution architecture. So assuming that we don't need to worry about that, don't, don't need to, to have information about the architect because that is uh, responsible uh, of, of the vendor that is providing the, the system. But uh, what we see is that um, the, 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 the organization must understand uh, about the, the architect, must, must, be, uh, uh, must have the appropriation of, of the architecture so it can take the decisions uh, in the future without being totally dependent on, on the vendor, must understand what is being delivered, what are the models, what are the dependencies, uh, what are the services being provided, so it can be um, uh, in, the, in the future uh, to, to, to lead uh, what changes may be made, integrations and so on uh, in the future. Okay, so it's a critical a capability that the organization must take the ownership and not just depend on the vendor. That's another one. Thank you, Jose. Any more questions from our audience? Y yes. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, actually, not not so much of a question. Um, and, oh. and that's a that's a follow up to what was just said. I mean. Um, my name is Farouk, uh, a former CIO. The, the, the biggest, um, I think, pitfall is, especially as a CIO going back to management, is always you are never sure the outcome of any initiative you are, you are bringing into the business because you don't have a true understanding of all the components and the impacts of the components on your initiative. So you end up in a guessing game and only pure intuition uh, trying to estimate what the outcome may be. So that is the biggest pitfall. It, it's you actually coming in with proposals wherever it came from, internal, external. Okay, in good faith that you are trying to uh, bring some sanity or productivity or some additional advantage to your business internal customer. But the truth is you really don't know the outcome because you don't have a clear view of your enterprise architecture. Thank you very so, much, Farouk, for- uh, Yeah, so, so, so that's it for that. Yes, Thank for the first one that was answered already, a, a backup to it is like, Yes, strategy is important. We want to design the fastest plane, aeroplane on F. That is our business strategy. The question is that, what capability do we have currently to do that? And what capabilities don't we have? What components do we have? What components? Have we ever done this? Yes, no. So yes, uh, while strategy is very clear, but the important thing is that at the end of it all is the little technical details that will make you understand whether you, you can actually uh, be successful or not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farouk. Any more questions, uh, audience? few minutes more to wrap it up. Okay, Jonathan, can I tip in just one? Yes, please, you're free to ask the questions. Thank you, Is very much. Yes, sir. 
I, I think Pedro also emphasized the fact that uh, Atlas, your solution is a generic uh, solution. But uh, something is beating my mind. You know, organizations are principally built on internal processes, culture, politics, and that kind of thing. So organizations are not, um, you know, the same. You know, they are, they are unique um, establishments. How does it, you know, looking at it from that context, how does Atlas, you know, address all this? My organization is a utility company in a way. How, how does Atlas, you know, um, address all the different issues with uh, different organizations when they want to adopt a EA? Okay. Yeah. So thank you for your question. In fact, um, as I said, uh, Atlas not only allows you to configure the, the, the concepts and models, because in, in, in even if you adopt uh, 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 an enterprise architecture framework, then you have to specialize it with the different uh, uh, details that you need for your organization, and, and each organization will give more relevance to some details than others. And uh, you also need to be able to configure in Atlas the rules and the, that you want to apply the principles so you do the way you work that can be done in two ways either defining the, the, the your processes how do you want to develop applications how you want to keep uh, how do you want to uh, assess the landscape current landscape how do you want to, de to de design new systems so all those activities you can uh, uh, configure it in Atlas, but also you can configure it with the set of rules and principles that you want everyone to follow in the company. So you may say that whenever uh, someone is presenting a given model, you want to specify a given uh, 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 rules of, so that the models must be compliant. So you, you, you can specify three major areas, all regarding to the information or the, the, the models that are there, Regarding the day-to-day -day activities that you want to start in your organization, that's also configurable, but also regarding the rules that the models and the practices must comply with. So these are the things that you can configure in your in the organization. Of course, you then can configure the groups and the, the, the roles and so on, so on. But these are the three areas that you can configure and therefore you can uh, uh, specialize the framework, the standard frameworks and the, the, uh, to your organization. OK. okay. Um, in addition to that, Pedro, maybe just to add that, uh, Raymond, and, uh, one other critical thing you need to take consideration of is skills, internal skills in respect of, uh, like Pedro mentioned earlier on, that there is the need to have uh, uh, an architect and some specific uh, roles that uh, are quite uh, uh, detailed enough. The other thing is that Atlas comes in as a tool, but there is some element of process that you need to redesign in how you do certain things so that those roles and responsibilities can be allocated. And that's what he captured by saying that uh, that whole team or framework that you are using, I mean, that whole setup, it comes what you call the integration competency center, where you even have certain, uh, some sort of like, uh, an EA committee that validates and approves certain uh, processes within the organization in terms of standards and all that. So um, there is a little bit more detail required. Uh, we're happy to engage with you and discuss that, but these are very critical things that you definitely need. Uh, definitely skills, uh, roles and responsibilities, some processes as to how you go about uh, bringing in applications, onboarding applications and decommissioning applications and stuff like that. And so it's a whole integration of the various components of the organization. And you also saw where, for example, from the PMO perspective, there is an integration between maybe whatever tool you're using to manage projects. So you can see uh, even projects dependencies and things like that. So it cascades into different stakeholders within the environment. Yeah. Any more questions? If there are no more questions, we will probably be wrapping this up. So another one minute for any question that comes to mind. Otherwise, you can always shoot us 
uh, an email for follow up questions to myself. Oh, there's a question. There's a question. OK, all right. OK, so if there are no more questions, let me say a very big thank you to all of you for making time to join us for this webinar on EA. Uh, we want to do more of such initiatives and we do hope that if you have any follow up questions or you want to meet with us and have deeper conversations, we're available. We will share the presentation slides to all of you through your emails. Uh, what might hinder us is the size of the video that we presented, so we'll figure out how to let you have that as well. Um, so you will be getting that through um, Esther and team who put this all together. On this note, thank you, Pedro, Jose, thank and you. Uh, the entire team, and thank you all of you for making time to join us this morning. God bless you. Thank you very thank you much. All.